Thank you very much to the organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak about what we do in the laboratory of Timothy Lu. I apologize, he cannot be here, so he sent me instead of him. The uh, Lu Lab is a large operation with many different <coughs> aspects, ranging from biomaterials to uh, eukaryotics in bio, with activities in cancer detection and treatment, and uh, also production platform. And um, is also involved in uh, biocomputation, so building all of those gates that SynBio is uh, so interested in. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, the last aspect that the lab develops, which involves uh, uh, possible applications of, of SynBio in infectious diseases, treatment, and microbiome engineering, all of that being somehow linked together. Um, the human uh, body is not just eukaryotic cells, it's also a very, very large amount of microbes, trillions of commensal microbes, um, and a very diverse type of microbes. The uh, gut microbiome, for example, is completely different from the skin microbiome, which is itself completely different even from the head microbiome. And what I'm going to focus on today is uh, the gut microbiome. Um, the microbiome, especially the gut microbiome, is uh, heavily involved in a lot of different aspects of health uh, that range from development to uh, immunity uh, eliciting at the very beginning of life, uh, digestion, mood, behavior, uh, and so many other things that are still to be discovered. Uh, but unfortunately, the tools to manipulate it when some problem is discovered are extremely limited. Uh, they are basically limited to wiping it out with antibiotics, possibly introducing pro or prebiotics, although their efficiency is heavily deb debated, uh, as they are. And once you've wiped it out with antibiotics, maybe replacing it with the uh, healthy microbiome of someone else. And that's about all we have as of today if you want to replace a microbiome. So, transplant change the microbiome with something completely different, which may or may not be healthy. Um, what we want to do is to have a much more delicate approach to microbiome engineering. We'd like to be able to either selectively add a bug with, given, uh, uh, with uh, predetermined functionalities to an existing microbiome, or possibly remove a bug which is involved in a, a pathogenic situation. And this requires tools that do not exist as of now. So the idea that we uh, want is uh, there may be a problem somewhere in the gut. You design a bug which will then be ingested, travel through the stomach, all the way through the intestine, reach the site of inflammation, cancer, you name it and then elicit a medical action to cure the problem. As I have written here, going from the mouth to somewhere in the gut requires passing through a lot of different environments. And this is where most of the previous applications of microbiome engineering, probiotics, and so on failed. Very few bugs are capable of adapting quickly enough and well enough to all those diverse environments to actually still be alive when they reach the site where they may do something. So that's one of the challenge. Uh, what we expect is that synthetic biology with its capability uh, to uh, design uh, uh, desired functions inside of microorganisms can help with uh, designing microbes that will uh, face this. So this is a very common uh, description of synthetic biology where it is usually uh, considered to emanate from a concept which leads to a design the design may be modeled and simulated, and there will be none of that today. Um, <laughs> uh, then it is constructed, probed, in vitro in some form of uh, isolated culture, measured, possibly evolved if something is not optimal. It's so rare, right? And then if it still fails, maybe go back to the design, go to, through another model iteratively, uh, until you manage to build whatever it is that you really wanted to build. And at MIT, we are an engineering school, so we are very much for that uh, top-bottom approach where you have an ID, and no matter what you will, build it. <laughs> um, lots and lots of work 
on uh, somehow modifying the microbiome uh, was based on E. coli. The vast majority of the probiotics that exist today are either coli or lactic acid bacteria. Coli is slightly better than lactic acid bacteria, but none of them really colonize the gut microbiome easily. Um, uh, you bet, um, sorry. Um, Gram-negative uh, of the type of E. coli are maybe something in the range of 0.1% of the gut microbiome, so it's almost negligible. It's not completely useless, but very much so. So we are looking for other possible uh, um, bacteria that would be more suited to um, um, creating a probiotic that would be stably maintained in the gut. And one such bacterium is a bacterium, it is theta iota micron. And you will uh, forgive me if I just call it theta, it's way too long. So theta is just like coli, a gram-negative bacterium. It's an obligate anaerobe, but it tolerates oxygen pretty well. It just does not grow, but at least it does not die. It's a member of a dominant phyla uh, uh, in the microbiome. It accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of the total a number of species in an average uh, human uh, gut microbiome. It is very abundant, up to 10 to the 10 uh, CFU per gram of stool in, again, an average human microbiome, uh, and is present in, the, uh, in a large, sorry, in a large amount of uh, um, microbiomes uh, of humans. And finally, it is relatively amenable to genetic modification. It's not nearly as easy as coli, but it's feasible. The problem with um, B theta iota micro micron is that although it is amenable to genetic modification, there are hardly any tools yet. And certainly nothing like we can have in coli where we have banks of various inducible or considerative promoters, large amounts of plasmids which are compatible so that you can add gazillions of uh, circuits inside of the exact same cell. So uh, the question is, how can we transfer uh, all of those different uh, um, biological computations? So those are examples of uh, uh, biological computations that were devised in the lab. So uh, the lab devised uh, uh, various methods for integrating memory inside of bacteria. We also devised ways to make analog computation. We worked also in digital computing uh, uh, like uh, many others. We also devised ways of rewriting DNA directly in vivo inside of the cells. Um, and all of that was developed for coli, but how can we transfer all of that into uh, theta when we don't even have a single promoter which is properly described? So the first step in doing uh, what we wanted to do was to develop a set of basic promoters, inducible and, um, and um, uh, constitutive, a set of ribosome binding sites, uh, the very basic set of tools that you need to build any circuit into any living organism. We started from that simple plasmid developed in the Gordon lab, uh, PNBU2, which is an integrative plasmid in theta iota micron uh, that integrates here, catalyzes its integration into a serine uh, tRNA. Uh, the good thing about that integration inside of a ser serine tRNA is that there are only two in theta. So if you inactivate one with your construct, the other one has to be here. So that limits the possibility of having multiple integrations. Um, and it is selected with uh, erythromycin, and it's a suicide plasmid, obviously, in theta. And uh, it has here a nanolook, which is a smaller version of luciferase that gives you a readout for anything you clone uh, in front of it. So what we'll do from that PNBU2 sequence is to vary ribosome binding site sequence just in front of Nandolook, vary promoter sequence, assay luciferase activity in different conditions and see what we can do, and finally engineer all of that to see if we can change levels. In coli, the ribosome binding site is well-defined. It has a consensus sequence of AGG, AGG that matches well to the end of the 16S RNA. All of that is good. And if you modify re uh, the, the sequences on both sides of the ribosome binding site or within the ribosome binding site, you can change the level of expression of genes from zero 
two maximum, which is whatever Kola is capable of <coughs> tolerating. In uh, Bacteroides, the consensus sequence of the ribosome binding site is not that different. Uh, it matches to the end of the 16S RNA just as well. Uh, and so the idea was, well, if we do exactly the same thing as in uh, coli, then that should work, right? Uh, that looks feasible. And even the natural coli ribosome binding site should work well enough. So there shouldn't be too many problems with translation. So that's exactly what we did. We took our PNBU2 plasmid. Uh, it had, we cloned a uh, known constitutive promoter from um, Theta in front of it. Uh, the Shine Dalgarno uh, was that of uh, that BT1311 gene. And we started making libraries by randomizing the sequences around the Shine Dalgarno and assessing function. So just for reference, this is the kind of thing you can get in coli when you modify the um, sequence of the ribosome binding site. So you get from very high to absolutely zero uh, with some of the uh, mutants you make. Interestingly enough, when you do exactly the same thing in theta, you go from high, so that red line here is the natural ribosome binding site, the one we started from. So we can increase a little bit, maybe half a log. We can decrease some, we can decrease by about two log, but there is no way to make it completely negative. For some reason, you can put any sequence and no matter what, you will still get some level of expression. Um, some people suggest that actually the pairing with the 16S RNA is not the major determinant of specificity of the ribosome binding site, and that in theta, it's more uh, binding to the S1 protein of the ribosome, which dictates recognition. Uh, so there's a lot less of the base pairing involved as recognition of an actual um, um, phosphate backbone, ribophosphate backbone, because I don't think anyone knows what it really binds. Nonetheless, we could still get something in the range of about three logs difference between the strongest and the weakest of our ribosome binding site. But it, this large difference in behavior between coli and theta probably exp explains why a lot of parts that were brought from coli into theta completely failed, because there are obviously uh, immense uh, differences in how the two bacteria work. Now we um, decided to look at promoters. So in coli, promoter specificity is dictated by a sigma factor. There are several in E. coli. I'm not going to go into the detail. Each of those sigma factor recognize consensus sequences, which are different. Uh, and so uh, exactly the same way as you could do with the ribosome binding sites earlier, if you modify either those um, consensus sequences or the sequences in the middle, you can vary the strength of the promoters. Theta has a completely different uh, promoter ar architecture. There is a single sigma factor, which is responsible for all uh, transcription in, the, in the, the, the genome of the bug. And the consensus sequence is pretty different from that of uh, coli with instead of a minus 10, a minus 7 box, and instead of a minus 35, a minus 33 box, which does not look very much like that of coli. So when you have a circuit that works in coli, it's pretty unlikely to work in theta directly because if the ribosome binding site may possibly work, there's no way uh, transcription will ever work. So we started building libraries of constitutive promoters uh, using the randomization strategy that I told you. So this is our starting promoter, PBT1311. We also cloned a few other uh, promoters from uh, B theta that were expected to work well. And we also started introducing variability in all those various regions highlighted in blue here, either replacing those regions with those from other promoters or from completely random sequences. And I'm just showing you here a few examples of the promoters we got out. Uh, and altogether, um, the different constitutive promoters we managed to build span about two logs of magnitude in expression level. So when you combine the different transcription levels we're capable of reaching with the different translation 
uh, uh, strength that we're capable of doing with the, the ribosome binding site library, we get about five log difference, which is about four logs more than whatever was possible before. But constitutive expression is still fairly limiting. Uh, a lot of the constructs we use for any circuit require being capable of turning things on and off on demand. So we uh, wondered how we could obtain inducible systems. Uh, bacteria, this theta iota micron, theta, um, has an extremely varied array of uh, carbon source usability. It is capable of degrading a lot more carbon sources than uh, coli, and just like coli, it senses them and induces the genes for their degradation only on demand when the carbon source is there. So there is a large amount of systems that can be borrowed from the genome for sensing at least carbon sources. <coughs> One such example is uh, the RAMNOSE regulation system. In uh, theta, RAMNOSE uh, sensing functions very much like Arabino sensing in coli. So you have a single regulator called RAR that binds to RAMNOSE and then activates uh, the uh, um, RAMNOSE operon uh, promoter. Uh, PBT3763, and so if we clone that promoter in front of NanoLook, you can see that while we increase RAMNO's uh, uh, concentration, we increase expression of, of NanoLook, uh, of luciferase, uh, and we get an about 104-fold difference between absence of inducer and inducer, which is pretty good. Uh, we screen the genome for other types of inducible promoters. A lot of those carbon sources are sensed through um, um, uh, kinase response regulator systems, two component systems, although those of theta are different from those of coli. Uh, and one such example is uh, the chondroitin sulfate response regulator, BT3334, uh, which senses chondroitin sulfate, activates the promoter, and we got about 60-fold with that system. Or the Arabino-Galactan system, uh, uh, encoded by uh, PBT0268, which gives us about 29-fold induction between absence or presence. Now we had a number of simple parts we wanted to check to what extent we could build more complicated parts. So try to import functions that are not native to uh, theta. And the most simple system to do that is probably the LAC system of coli. So we wanted to see if we could get LACI to function in theta. So we put LACI under the control of uh, theta promoter, PBT1311, actually, um, and then created a mutant of the PBT3111 promoter with uh, LAC operator sites at various locations. And we build actually all possible combinations of one, two, or three um, operators. Interestingly, uh, they all worked. They did not work great. Uh, there is a limited uh, dynamic range in those promoters. But what's interesting is that by modifying the uh, uh, relative position of those uh, lack operators, we could change the sensitivity of those promoters. So that gave us the possibility to induce uh, uh, at various levels of IPTG. Finally, we tested whether all of those promoters that have different inducers, but remember they're all sugars or uh, derivatives of sugars, were orthogonal to each other. That is, if the inducer of one system would induce another promoter. And what you can see on that graph is that there is induction when you combine uh, the, the inducer of a given system with its corresponding promoter, but absolutely not any induction with the other inducer, so they're perfectly orthogonal. So now we have a good library of parts for uh, transcriptional uh, uh, control, and we wanted to see if we could go a little farther in complexity. And what we've done is to see if we could replicate uh, memory integration inside of theta. The idea behind that memory in integration is pretty simple. Uh, it uses the capacity of uh, integrases to uh, flip pieces of DNA between inverted recognition sites for that given uh, integrases. And we used uh, a system developed by our neighbors in the Void Lab where they built an array of different uh, integrase recognition sites 
along with all of the integrases that specifically recognize each of those sites. We only cloned four of them as a test trial and checked uh, what happened if we would uh, transform a theta carrying this on its genome with uh, plasmids constitutively expressing uh, the, in the integrase. And what these gels tell you is that in the presence of the uh, corresponding uh, integrase, you get the right, uh, the, the expected uh, inversion. So everything works great. We then checked briefly if it worked with an inducible uh, integrase. And to make a long story short, it does. It does actually beautifully, much better than in coli, because we have absolutely no activity of the recombinase when we don't add any uh, inducer, which is rare of coli promoters. The vast majority of coli promoters have some leakiness, especially in those systems. Um, Still pushing further in complexity, we wanted to check if we could benefit from all of the advances of CRISPR-Cas. So I'm expecting everyone is familiar with CRISPR-Cas, but in case not, very briefly, Cas9, the natural Cas9 is a nuclease which requires a small RNA to direct itself to the appropriate sequence in the DNA that it then cleaves. Um, here we're using a D-Cas9, which is a deactivated Cas9, so uh, the uh, active site of the nuclease were um, modified so that it can no longer cut DNA, but it can still land on it and stay there. So what we were hoping with a D-Cas9 based system was that we could perturb uh, expression from uh, genes. The first system we built was pretty simple. It used uh, an IPTG inducible D-Cas9. We would clone whatever guide RNA we need to direct uh, uh, DCAS9 to given sequences within the promoter or the coding sequence of NanoLook, and then we would measure luciferase activity as a function of IPTG. And what this graph, or this graph, they both show the same thing, show you, is that uh, it works beautifully when you add IPTG, then luciferase activity goes down, indicating that uh, the DCAS9 really does land here and does prevent transcription. It's a little surprising though that even uh, the uh, uh, single guide RNA is targeting the coding sequence of luciferase still had an activity. Again, this is a big difference with coli. In coli, uh, uh, DCAS9 really only works if you target within the promoter and as soon as you get outside of the promoter, it quickly sees working. Um, we then wanted to check again with that system if we could target endogenous genes. Uh, these two genes here are involved in polymixin B resistance. So we wanted to check if by using the DCAS9 targeted system, we could inactivate those genes and thus um, decrease resistance to polymixin. And that's indeed what happens. We also use that exact same system, but targeting some of the carbon source usability uh, 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 operands of, um, of theta. And you can see here that when we induce the DCAS9 system with IPTG, then growth on fructose st uh, stops pretty abruptly, indicating that uh, the, the targeting works uh, as expected. Everything tends to work pretty easily in the lab in a uh, culture medium. Very often when you go to a more natural environment, things stop working. So we wanted to see to what extent all of those parts that we had built would still work within uh, some form of natural environment and we chose mice because they're easy to <coughs> manipulate. So what we did was to treat mice with streptomycin to strip them off of, their, of most of their uh, uh, microbiome, then remove antibiotics, colonize with uh, various theta, uh, uh, theta strains that would not have synthetic constructs, and then uh, treat those microbiomes with inducers as needed, collect the stools, and then measure luminescence uh, and measure the uh, presence and abundance of theta by qPCR. The first system we tried was a very simple arabinogalactan-induced luciferase system just to see if anything would happen whatsoever. And what you can see here is that 
this represents times when there is arabinogalactan in the water of uh, the mice. And you can see that there is a sharp increase in luciferase activity in the stool as we induce. And it goes back to baseline very quickly after we remove inducer. So it seems to, be, uh, to, to work well. We then tested the CRISPR system in a similar system. So it's exactly the same system as I, uh, as I presented earlier. It's just a lot more complicated. So there are a lot more places where things could go wrong. Nonetheless, it still works OK. We're probably reaching the border of what no longer works. But here again, we have IPTG addition. And you can see that when we add IPTG, luciferase activity drops, which is exactly what we would expect when it stays perfectly flat. Uh, in the system that doesn't have uh, all of the um, regulatory systems. So here I have described an additive system to add a programmed microbe inside of the microbiome. The problem is doing it still requires a pretty heavy treatment with antibiotics to strip off everything that is not really desired and replace it with what we want. So we are now focusing our efforts on trying to build systems to selectively remove a given member of the microbiome and replace it with what we want, a subtractive approach to uh, microbiome engineering. Our first attempt at that uh, was using, uh, again, Cas9, this time the real Cas9, the one that cuts DNA. Um, and was aimed at targeting antimicrobial anti resistance gene in a natural environment. So the idea was pretty simple. You have a delivery vehicle, in this case, phage M13, because it's very easy to engineer. That M13 delivers a piece of DNA that has the Cas9, the trace RNA, which is required for Cas9 functionality, and most importantly, arrays of guide RNAs that direct Cas9 to their target. And the target may be in the genome or in plasmids. And uh, in most cases in bacteria, when you make a double strand cut, the cell just dies. It's particularly true on plasmids because most plasmids have toxin and antitoxin systems. And if you make a double strand cut, very quickly the antitoxin degrades and the toxin kicks in, killing the cell. Um, so results can be seen here. Uh, here you have all of the control strains. Uh, that means they do not have the target for the Cas9 system. And you see that there is absolutely no toxicity. So if the target for uh, the guide RNA is not here, nothing happens. However, you can see here, for example, that in a strain that has NDM1, the phage that targets the NDM1 sequence kills uh, the cells. Uh, here you have a similar system targeting another uh, type of antimicrobial anti resistance genes. And exactly the same thing happens. Uh, it is very specific to the sequence, and you can even mix the phages together and target both at the same time if you want. You can also direct uh, the um, uh, Cas9 cleavage to the chromosome. This is what we've done here. Uh, we've isolated a mutant of uh, our uh, test strain EMG2 uh, that is now lidixic acid resistant, so has a mutation JAR-A. This is a single base pair mutation. And the uh, uh, guide, as you can see, is extremely specific. It kills the mutant. It does not kill the wild type. Um, what we've done next was to see if we could counter-select um, um, virulence factors. So here we've been targeting the intimin uh, gene that we've heard uh, uh, about yesterday, I believe, um, which is a, a major virulence factor of uh, enterohemorrhagic coli. And once again, with the proper um, uh, with the proper um, um, guide RNAs, we managed to uh, eradicate uh, the the. Uh, targeted cells with our engineered phages. And we've uh, also looked at whether or not these engineered M13 phages could help with survival in the case of infection. We've used a waxworm model here, and we're following death of the worms after being injected with either uh, a non-sensitive cell, so bacteria that cannot be targeted by our engineered M13, or um, 
uh, cells that can be targeted with uh, the uh, intimin targeting phage. And what you can see is that if you don't infect the uh, waxworms, they don't die. Uh, if you infect them with uh, uh, just a phage or with, uh, sorry, with a phage which does not target uh, the strain that we are also putting in the worms, they die. If you treat them with SM buffer, so just any buffer, they die. But if you treat them with the intimin targeting uh, phage, which is the one that can kill off the bacteria that we're injecting, they survive significantly better. There is one major flaw with that project. M13 is wonderful for molecular biology. It's small, it's easy to, uh, to engineer. You can do a lot of things with it. The problem is it's absolutely F dependent. It's a conjugative plasmid and F is extremely rare in nature. So this is a very nice system in the lab, absolutely useless in real life. So we have to find other delivery vehicles. The system can work, but we need other delivery vehicles. Uh, phages are probably one of the most efficient uh, system uh, for delivering DNA to bacteria. Conjugation requires way to intimate contacts to be useful again in the context of a microbiome where you have billions and billions of other bacteria. So the probability of encounter close enough between your donor bacteria and your re recipient bacteria is way too low. So um, classically, if you want more phages, you isolate them from nature. Uh, and you end up with a wide variety of phages that may or may not be strictly lytic, that may or may not integrate into the genome, that may or may not possess uh, virulence factors. And you assemble them into a cocktail of phages that collectively target all of the possible strains that you need to target. Um, the problem with that is that for every phage you add to your cocktail, you need a whole lot of tests to make sure that everything works the way you want it to work. Uh, so the approach that we are trying to use is what if we could transform phages into some form of antibody where we keep everything that makes it a phage, that makes it a good delivery vehicle, and change what makes it target a given type of strain so that you can develop a set of phages originating from the exact same chassis, but targeting different bacteria. Maybe a graphical visualization will make it clearer. Let's say that these are all the strains you need to target to treat any given disease. They all have a different envelope. They may have different sets of genes inside of them that may provide defenses against phages. Traditionally, you go into a sewer plant or whatever natural environment suits you. Uh, gather a few liters of the, uh, of the effluent, and pretty easily you find phage against pretty much any bacteria. So that's what you see here. You find phages, and they may infect a single bacterium or infect several, and it's pretty unpredictable. Then, if you want to use them in any kind of industrial setting, they need to be tested one by one for specificity, for stability in terms of storage for their biology. Do they have virulence factors? Are they lysogenic or strictly lytic? Then if it is for a medical application, you also need to test safety, uh, efficacy, delivery, all of that one by one before you finally think about putting them all together and have a product, which obviously, uh, because bacteria where they are, they evolve. So that cocktail will need to be updated probably twice yearly. So twice a year, you need to go through all of that for your new cocktail. That just cannot work. So what if instead of that, we use a single chassis, a single phage, which we have decided is a good starting point, make all of those uh, uh, testings so that we know everything about it, everything we can. And for some of the phages we already have, this is almost there. And then simply grab from all of those natural phages or all of the DNA banks that we have, the sequences that we need to make that single chassis infect all of the strains. Hopefully then, limiting the amount of testing you need to make to get it approved for any kind of medical application. Obviously at this point, this is just a project. Uh, but actually the FDA at least is pretty interested in it and we have some fair amount of hope that this can be a viable solution to phage therapy in Western worlds. 
So let's test it. The phage we decided to use for initial taste testing of that ID is uh, the family of T7. The reason why we decided to use uh, T7-like phages is because they are very widespread in nature. They're very easy to use in the lab. They are well studied and understood. Uh, they have a relatively short genome, genome with few activities, so not too, much, too many chances for uh, uh, surprises. And most importantly, they are extremely host independent. Outside of their receptor at the surface of the bacterium, the only other gene they need from their host is the cyoredoxin, which is an adjuvant to their own uh, RNA polymerase to make it more processive. So there is hope that it can actually work in a wide variety of um, bugs. The other reason is bioinformatic. If you align all of the tail fiber genes, which is the major uh, host determinant in T7, uh, from all of the sequence T7-like phages together, what you find is that the first about 150 amino acids are pretty conserved, whereas the rest is not conserved at all. Uh, the consensus to explain that is that that uh, 150 amino acid uh, and terminus is involved in binding the tail fiber to the phage because the rest is different because it infects different bacteria. So it needs to recognize different receptors. So one of the idea is can we start from T7 or T3 and graft <coughs> inside of either one of them any of those other tail fibers, thus changing host range. Summarized here. So you take phage A that infects bacterium A, phage B that infects bacterium B. What happens if you graft the tail fiber gene of gene B of phage B inside of uh, bacteriophage A? Does it go after bacterium B, bacterium A, or something completely different? Um, to start simply, we started with T7 and T3. They are both coliphages, they are both well studied, they are both understood, but they don't both recognize the exact same receptor. While T7 uh, binds somewhat deeply uh, in the LPS of coli, T3 binds at the very top. So that uh, in principle, uh, and it's been demonstrated in some cases, uh, exchanging the uh, uh, um, gene should change the phenotype. And we can indeed see that here, uh, while, um, sorry, while um, T3 and T7 infects B strain perfectly well, as, uh, 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 as well as regular K12 cloning strains, T3 here does not infect MT1655 or BW25113, which T7 does. So we now have a screen if we uh, change the GP17 genes to, uh, I'm going to skip because time is running out. Um, so now, how are we going to do that? Because engineering phages is much more complicated than it seems. Uh, traditionally, it's done with allyl replacement systems. Uh, to make it short, because I'm running out of time, this rarely works. It's long and painful. So what we've developed is a system that uses uh, the gap repair system of Saccharomyces cerevisiae to completely reconstruct the genomes inside of yeast before booting them back to life inside of coli. So the system is pretty simple. You isolate the genome of whatever phage you want to play with. You need a yeast artificial chromosome, which will make the final construct uh, uh, replicate inside of yeast. You transform either the genome plus the yak or uh, various PCR products that span the entire length of the chromosome of the phage with ends uh, uh, homologous to the yeast artificial chromosome. And yeast, by some miracle, reassembles that into a fully assembled genome. You extract that yeast artificial chromosome, transform it into bacteria, and if you've done your design properly, you get functional phages, which you can then maintain, grow, play with. Obviously, in some cases, it's not going to work, but at least compared to early replacement methods, we have the yeast clone. We can at least go back, sequence regions, check if it didn't work because something happened during the PCR, there is a mutation and the phage is dead, or if that's simply our design, which is wrong, and we need to go back to the drawing board. 
Interestingly enough, that works with a lot of different phages. So we've tested it with a number of different T7-like phages. And again, long story short, it works with all of them independently of what host they normally infect. And we built from T7, a T7 that has the T3 uh, tail fiber, and a T7 that has just the C-terminal part of um, the T3 tail fiber. Remember that only the end terminus is conserved. We had no idea if the T3 tail fiber would be able to bind uh, the T7 capsid by itself. So um, here is again uh, all of those phages uh, plated on, um, on BL21, which is a common host for them, and then tested against oops, um, a selective host. You can see that while T7 still grows on MG1655, the reconstructed T7 has exactly the same phenotype, but the T7 with the T3 tail fiber no longer grows on MG1655, and conversely for the T3 mutants. So the idea works. If you change the tail fiber genes, you can change host range. We then uh, wanted to see if we could cross species barrier. Uh, here we resorted to a completely synthetic approach to making the genomes. Um, it turns out that that phage R that infects Yersinia only has three point mutation difference in the, uh, with the T3 gene 17, uh, so the tail fiber genes. So instead of sourcing out gene R, amplifying the whole GP17, we just decided to order a piece of DNA that corresponded to that region where there are the uh, mutations, and then go through the exact same assembly process to make a T3 phage with uh, the R um, C terminus uh, of uh, the tail fiber. And you can see here that while T3 does not grow on Yersinia, T3R grows perfectly fine on Yersinia and kills it extremely efficiently um, in vitro. We wanted to go even farther and try something a little more difficult. We had tried, so K11 here, uh, sorry, it's nowhere. K11 is a Klebsiella phage. Uh, Klebsiella is very different from coli in that they are all capsulated, in sharp contrast with the laboratory coli, which all have a rather rough phenotype. So a capsule is something that a normal tail fiber cannot bind to. It's a thick layer of mucus surrounding the cell, and that prevents the phages that recognize LPS from actually finding it. So we wanted to see if we could graft onto T7 something that would allow it to go through that capsule and infect Klebsiella. So our first attempt was to simply replace the tail fibers of T7 with those from K11, but that did not work. We don't know why, but it did not work. So we started trying out all of the possible combinations, and it turns out that if we replace the whole tail, the tail being composed of GP11, 12, and 17, then we get a phage that infects Klebsiella just as well type. So this is um, T7 on coli, K11, uh, T7 on Klebsiella, you see it does not infect, there are no plaques. Uh, and here we have K11 wild type, it does not infect coli, but infects Klebsiella. And if you bring the tail of K11 into T7, then you get a phage that grows on Klebsiella. And conversely, if you bring the T7 tail inside of K11, you get a phage that grows on uh, coli. So that tells us that although uh, tail fiber swapping is a method that can work, it's not always uh, sufficient. And that points out to the uh, extreme lack of knowledge we have in the structure function relationship in phages. Because there is no reason why just cloning the C terminus of K11 GP17 would not work. There is no bioinformatic way to predict that. Still, it did not work. Uh, so we are here hoping for, uh, as Patrick was saying, uh, maybe more predictive tools, maybe more bioinformatics. Maybe it's just that the tools that we have are not sufficient. What I want to point out, and that will be the end, and I will almost be on time, uh, is that we used those uh, engineered phages in uh, synthetic uh, bacterial consortia uh, to check if they could work just as well as well-type phages in removing their specific bacteria in the context of some simple microbiome. This is all in vitro. We are uh, doing any more experiments right now, but they're not uh, uh, at all ready. 
so the ID is pretty sim simple. You mix in uh, approximately equal uh, amount uh, probiotic colinisol, uh, the target strain for K11, uh, uh, the target strain for um, uh, R, uh, Yersinia, and then you try the various phage combinations and see what happens after a short while. And what you can see is that even in 30 minutes, when you add K11 onto uh, that uh, synthetic consortia, um, um, Klebsiella is completely annihilated. So on a pie chart like that, it's difficult to see uh, but we have an about five order of magnitude decrease. Uh, so there is a very tiny croissant here. It's just not visible. Uh, and the same thing is true if you use uh, the, the engineered phage uh, T7, K11, GP11, 12, 17. Although just as we could see earlier, it's not quite as efficient. It's probably good enough, but it's not quite as good. But if you give it a little more time, it still works. And um, if you mix T7, which targets Yersinia, and uh, the phage targeting Klebsiella, then you can, almost, you can completely remove uh, the, the, the two pathogens in about an hour. That being said, uh, I would like to acknowledge members of the lab. As I said, the LULAB is a big operation, lots of people. So particularly Hiroki Ando, who worked with me on all of the uh, phage engineering work. Uh, Rob Sitorik, who worked on the M13 uh, CAS delivery. Uh, Fahim uh, and Mark, who worked on uh, the bacteriotis aspect of things, along with our collaborators from the Chris Voigt lab. And all of the other members of the lab and uh, our funding sources. Thank you very much.